So thank, thank you everyone for having me. Um, my talk won't be quite as entertaining as Dr. Tamler's, but I will do my best to keep everyone awake. So when we're talking about topics for discussion, Ronald and I had discussed topics to speak about, and he had said, hey, let's have you do diabetes drug safety. And I said, great, that sounds like a wonderful topic. And then as I started to dig through it, I said, this is going to be a five-hour discussion. <laughs> so what I then selected was some of the latest issues that have come up. And clearly in the um, panel session later, should there be any other questions about other specific agents, I'll be happy to answer them. Finally, I want to say that you're not going to walk out of this lecture having all the answers. Most of what I'm going to discuss today is still controversial. In the discussion section, if you have specific questions, you may get my personal opinion, but on much of this, these are still unanswered questions. So with that said, let's proceed. Okay, so I too do have a couple of disclosures, and in this day and age, we're always happy to have those. Um, first, I'd just like to state that some of the treatments that are discussed, not so much now, but potentially during the discussion section, may not be currently on label or approved by the FDA. I have been a consultant for Janssen Pharmaceuticals, as well as Medtronic Minimed. And I do actually have some research support at the current time from clinical trials from Novo Nordisk. So what are the goals of this talk? I'm going to give you a very brief review of non-insulin treatments for patients with type 2, which Dr. Tamil already did, so it's going to be just one quick slide, actually, that he's already showed, but just to remind everyone. Then I'm going to spend some time talking about some risks and benefits of specific agents for diabetes. And then a little bit just for us to all think about is what is proven and what is a potential risk. And the problem with potential risks are is it's hard to prove a negative. So Issues become raised, but it's very difficult to unequivocally rule out something. So we all need to keep that in our minds as we go through some of this. And there have been products that have been removed from the market already, where then in retrospect, uh, maybe not so bad. But these issues will come up, and safety is always a major concern of the FDA, as we all know. Okay. So once again, you've already seen this list, and I now realize the top gets cut off, so I apologize for that. But this is just a quick review once again of the oral medications. I will also be talking about non-insulin injectables. Dr. Leroy afterwards will be speaking about some of the insulin safety issues. But for now, this is just our list. And Dr. Tamler reviewed most of these in detail, so I'm not going to go through that. What I am going to briefly discuss are some of the concerns for some of these non-insulin therapies in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So, the ones that are in white on this slide are ones that most people are quite familiar with and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because, as I said, this lecture would be way too long. And I excluded some of the ones that are not as commonly used, which Dr. Tamler did review some of the details on. So um, metformin, we're all familiar with lactic acidosis, and that relates to some of the contraindications that we think about with impaired renal function, cardiac issues, et cetera. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, they clearly have a great role, and Dr. Tamler just discussed those, but the things to keep in mind are the GI distress, which he already mentioned. And just another point I do want to make out, to pe make out for people is that there is a risk of hypoglycemia with these products if someone's on combination therapy with a hypoglycemic agent. And what you need to keep in mind with that is that non-glucose, simply glucose-containing products, may not work as effectively due to the blockade of absorption of carbohydrate. So to treat hypoglycemia for patients um, who are on not solely alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, you need to give them glucose tablets. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, secretagogues, we know, predominantly the side effect is hypoglycemia. TZDs, um, we all know about the edema and weight gain, and I'm not going to spend any time on that right now, but I'm going to talk about some of the newer issues that have been raised regarding both bladder and bone. DP4 inhibitors and GLP-1 analogs, well, there's even been articles in the New York Times about all this, um, which I'm going to get into a bit. Um, and then finally, I'm going to spend a few moments on the SGLT2 inhibitors. Okay. So, pioglitazone. And I will tell you, the more I dug into this, the more challenging it became to come up with definitive answers. So there's two issues that have come up here, and Dr. Tamler already mentioned the ADOPT study um, to people previously. So two of the large studies looking at rosiglitazone, which is now a non-preferred medication due to a question of cardiovascular issues, um, showed that there was a higher incidence of fractures. Subsequent studies have also shown, and this is, I love the title of this, the health 
ABC study, Aging and Body Composition Study, and studies nowadays have great names. This was a four-year observational study that looked at 666 patients with diabetes, and what was noted was is that in women who were taking TZDs and that N was 69, there was greater bone loss in specific areas as compared to the non-TZD patients. In addition to that, there have been studies not just looking at rosy glitazone, but also at pi as pyoglitazone. And what those studies showed is that one of them in the UK revealed that there was a, an association with low trauma fractures in both men and women. However, the conclusion from this was is that the absolute risk appeared to be quite small, and I'm going to show you some of the conflicting data at this point. So this is one study that recently came out showing a different suggestion here. So this is a study looking at pyoglitazone on, and the bone. And what you actually will notice on this slide is, is that compared to placebo, so this was actually a study looking at this issue, there was, although a trend with pyoglitazone at 12 months as well as at 18 months, it did not meet statistical significance in terms of risk from bone status. So, other confounders in these research studies, we don't know vitamin D status, we don't know duration of postmenopause factors in terms of the women in the uh, prior studies. So it's confounded and the data is still unclear. It would certainly make sense in patients to make sure they have good calcium and vitamin D status, but the answers are still not yet in on this question. Okay, another topic, and um, there's always concern about malignancy questions. There's a question about pyoglitazone and bladder cancer that's recently come up. And the initial data um, that looked at this was some from Diabetes Care, and I list this study up here. This was actually a registry study from Kaiser Permanente. And there are some confounders with all types of registry studies, but patients who were over 40 years of age between the years of 97 and 2002 were evaluated. And what was looked at was ever use of each of the diabetes medications in terms of patient's treatment regimens and how they define use. Because as we all know, patients may, you may give them a prescription, they may not fill it. But in this database, they were actually able to look up prescription um, renewals and such, is that they defined it as two or more prescriptions filled within six months. And this was treated as a time-dependent variable. And then what was looked at was results. So what was found in this was is that actually in terms of patients, there was a total number of patients with diabetes. The subject on PIO was clearly smaller. There were 90 cases of bladder cancer in the PIO users and 791 in the non-PIO. Well, that actually doesn't sound that impressive um, if you actually do the ratios in the math. However, what they did subsequently look at was in more detail. So first they found out that in this group there was not an increased risk. However, with longer duration therapy, it appeared that there was an increased risk um, with the caveat that most of these were diagnosed at an early stage, okay? And this slide actually just depicts that data I presented to you. And what you'll see here is, let me just find the point that I wanted to make here, is that um, with cumulative dose, you'll see an increased risk, okay? So um, just something to keep in mind. Subsequent to that, um, and it doesn't usually happen this way, but this is what did happen, is that the French Agency for Safety of Health Products and Risk of Bladder Cancer did another study, and what they found again was that there was, a, there was an increased risk of bladder cancer in patients on pyoglitazone, once again, just like the other study, based on dose and duration of use. What has subsequently happened with this is that both in France and Germany, pyoglitazone has actually been suspended from use. Currently, the FDA, um, who's usually much more restrictive, has taken a much more cautious view on this and has felt that this data is not currently conclusive and ongoing studies are occurring. We hope to get those answers soon, okay? I guess the caveat to keep in mind with all this is think about your patient, look at their doses, look at their duration. You know, there are some patients that this is the only product you can use. So you use what you do because glucose control is very important, and as, I, as was stated, you just need to follow your patients at this point. There's no more to note. Um, what about, this is a much hotter area, and um, Dr. Tamler spent a lot of time on GLP-1s and dpp 4 so I think it's worth discussion of these issues. So let's talk about these products 
we already know the mechanism of action based on Tom, Dr. Tamler's discussion. So when liraglutide first came out, and I will disclose another piece of information, is I actually used to be a medical employee at Novo Nordisk several years ago. I received no money. I received nothing from them at this point. But so I'm actually very, very familiar with this data. So when this product initially came out, there was a warning about a risk of thyroid C cell tumors with this product. It's called the black, black box warning. And everyone gets all nervous when there's a black box and nobody's going to use the product. Well, when you actually look at this, is what you see, and, and that's why the FDA probably let this through, is because the data really looks more at rodents than at humans, and I'm going to go through another slide that confirms that data, is that long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists, if you're a rat, can cause thyroid C-cell tumors at clinically relevant doses, and often many of us will say to our patients, if you're a rodent, I wouldn't be prescribing this to you. However, once again, as I said earlier, you can't prove a negative. It, it's it's very challenging in the pharmaceutical field. So for that reason, it does say on the label that human relevance could not be determined by clinical or non-clinical trials, although no reports of medullary thyroid cancer were reported. And for that reason, since we don't know the status in patients who have conditions that are predisposed to medullary thyroid cancer, such as MEN2 or personal or family history of MTC, the product is contraindicated in those patients. People will sometimes say to me, well, what about if they have papillary cancer or any of those? It's been shown, not shown to be in association with those. Okay, so this is just to show you what I was talking about before. And this is some data looking at what happens, the responsiveness and the markers of GLP-1 receptors in rodents on their thyroid cells. So what you see here is there are none on humans, but if you're a rat, you're potentially at risk for thyroid issues. And I'm gonna actually show you a little more data about this. Shifting gears, there's a lot with GLP-1s and dpp 4 so I, I, I apologize for that, but um, I wanted to make sure we covered all the topics. So the other ones that we've all heard about is pancreatitis with incretin-based therapies. And this is yet another one that is controversial, but there is a warning on the label at the current time. So what we know is that there are cases of pancreati pancreatitis with both exanatide, liraglutide, and dpp 4 inhibitors have been lit reported and have led to both warnings and precautions. What we also know is that there is a 2.8-fold greater risk of pancreatitis in all comers in patients with diabetes. This very well may be multifactorial. We think about the risks of pancreatitis. Sometimes it can be a gallbladder issue. It can be hypertriglyceridemia. We see these in our patients with diabetes. So that said, we need to think about other data that we have available. So there were large U.S. commercial database analyses that revealed no increased risk, at least for exanatide and citagliptin, because they were the first two to market, compared with both metformin or gliburide. That said, the FDA, when liraglutide was released, it was released, did request more epidemiologic data and insurance database information. And this just shows you what that data showed. And what you'll see here is that it didn't look particularly remarkable. So at present, the data is conflicting, and really what's recommended is to use caution with any of these agents. You need to think about it. You need to get a history of pancreatitis, and you need to warn patients of the symptoms. And any new cases should be reported to the FDA. And this becomes a confounder with reporting bias. Now that we're all aware of it, are there more being reported? And maybe there really isn't an issue. But these are just some items to keep in mind. I will sometimes get phone calls, well, if someone had a history of gallstone pancreatitis, can I start a GLP-1? You know, based on the listing, you should use it with caution. You need to use your clinical judgment in terms of risks and benefits with all of these products. Okay. Um, shifting gears here. There was a publication in the New York Times where most of us get a good chunk of our medical information um, about, I'm going to say about six or seven months ago. Um, reporting um, some of the work by Peter Butler, who's out of the UCLA in California, with some work on questions of whether pancre pancreatic cancer might be related to use of DPV-4 inhibitors, as well as in his reports, GLP-1 analogs. So in the work of Butler, he had noticed some questions in rats, and as we've already learned from prior data, rats and people are not exactly the same in the diabetes world. Um, Further review by Butler 
revealed a publication that suggested that there was an increased risk of pancreatitis and cellular changes called pancreatic duct metal metaplasia in patients with type 2 diabetes treated with GLP-1s and DBD4. So you're going to say, well, how did he get this information? Basically, he did autopsy reports. These were people who had died for other reasons who happened to have been on these products. They analyzed their pancreases, and that's how they found this data. Um, there are a lot of challenges with that, because anyone who just simply is on a product, as, as we know in patients with type 2 diabetes, there is an imp potentially increased risk even of pancreatic cancer. When you present with diabetes, it may be a misdiagnosis. There are a lot of factors in here. So based on the current findings, really none of the endocrine societies felt that there was nearly enough data to indicate an increased risk with these medications. Once again, they said the numbers were too small, but at the current time, this is not felt to be a significant concern. More data is needed, but it is not felt to be an issue. There's subsequent data, which I'm also going to show you, and this gets back to the, um, the issues in rodents. And as I already said to you, well, rodents aren't people. If you don't see an increased signal, and this is no, no um, liraglutide, and this is increasing doses, you really don't see a significant issue. You see some beta cell hyperplasia, but that's actually expected with GLP-1s, but you don't see any abnormality. So then you're going to all come back to me. We just told us rodents are worthless. Okay, well, what about monkey data? Well, there's actually some monkey data. The ends are small, but what you don't see here are any signals related to these products, which I think is somewhat reassuring. Once again, the N is small, but it, it, it is reassuring. I will share with you that when this data came out, I received about 10 or 15 phone calls from patients expressing concern on this, but with the data we have available, it is, it is at the present time fairly reassuring. So once again, this is just to reiterate what I just showed you, um, is that even exquisitely high doses, we did not see any significant risks in patients. Um, here's some data from gastroenterology that was recently published. It shows a sl potentially a slightly different suggestion, but what it shows you here is slight trends, but once again, nothing in this. And you'll see this up here, but you've got to realize the N is extremely small, and this is FDA reporting, and that's what I got into before. You're not going to report something unless you think it's an issue. So then you hear about, please report to the FDA any potential cases. When I worked at Novo, there were many cases that came up with question of pancreatitis. When you actually sat down, it wasn't pancreatitis when you dug through the data. So this is very challenging when a physician simply reports data to know if it's accurate. Okay. Recently came out at the European Association, um, European Association Society is not right for diabetes, but it's the, Derek, do you know what the actual name of that is? I messed it up here. Study. You've hit study. Okay, thank you. <laughs> European, European Association Study for Diabetes, there were two studies that just came out with the DPP-4 inhibitor classes. And the SAVER study looked at saxagliptin and found that there was no increased risk for pancreatitis and that's similar with pancreatic cancer. There just did not seem to be a signal. Examine, which was looking at another um, DPP-4 inhibitor, allagliptin, once again as well, did not reveal any cases of pancreatitis there was a slight signal um, with, in both groups with, with pancreatitis, but pancreatic cancer, really nothing to remark on. Okay, shifting gears. I've covered a lot so far, and I realize that there's a lot to absorb, and I'm betting there's some questions, and if there's time, we'll talk at the end or wait till the final session. So just going to talk a little bit again about the SGLT2 inhibitors, and Dr. Tamler already gave you this slide, but basically what you need to think about is what the SGLT2 inhibitors do is they lower the urinary glucose threshold for excretion of glucose. And in patients with type 2 diabetes, it's actually shifted the opposite way. The typical glucose excretion threshold is about 160 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. In patients with type 2, it often shifts to a higher number. But with these products, it shifts it back over to the left. So people are excreting glucose in the urine at a much lower level. It's advantageous in terms of glucose control as well as it being advantageous in terms of weight loss. However, there are adverse events just as there are with any product. So the big ones that you need to think about here are, um, for these products, are mycotic infections. Okay, well, if you actually think about it, and this is in comparison to, um, to glimepiride, it's not a huge surprise. 
you're having increased urinary glucose <coughs> excretion. We often hear of our patients with type 2 diabetes with suboptimal glucose control that they may be at risk for these types of issues. So that's something to think about. Um, not as much of an increase in urinary tract infections. Now, the other thing these products will do is they'll lead to an osmotic diuresis. You're peeing out more. So by peeing out more, you're potentially at greater risk for volume depletion and orthostatic hypertension. Okay. So as I mentioned, the most common reactions were these mycotic infections, and you need to use with caution in patients who have a history of that or at least warn them. Most of these were very well treated with either topical or oral therapy. And you know, you just need to really weigh, weigh the risks and benefits as you need to with every patient. In terms of other things I just want to bring to your attention, one of them is the lipids. Okay, so some of you may remember the whole issue with rosy glitazone that had come up, and I, it, I, whether I believe that data or not is a whole other discussion, but is that rosy glitazone slightly raised the LDL. We all poo-pooed it and said, okay, well, that's fine. We'll just boost the statin up. We need to keep in mind that these products do have a very subtle rise in LDL cholesterol. Not dramatic, subtle. And is that significant? Okay, we don't know. It also happens to raise HDL, but it raises LDL as well. You can clearly make the argument to boost the statin. There are cardiovascular safety studies that are now ongoing, but just something to keep in mind. Okay. Volume depletion is an additional one. There are no clear guidelines as to what to do with your patients on diuretics. So you just need to be cautious once again. You might want to consider a dose reduction, but we don't have any clear guidelines on this. So you just need to think about it with each of your patients that you'll start on these agents. Okay. So in summary, um, and I do go quickly, um, all of the treatments that we currently have available for patients with diabetes, we need to keep in mind pose potential risks. I didn't even touch on all of them. The risk-benefit ratio must be carefully analyzed, and you need to really individualize it. And that's the challenge as well as the joy of diabetes as far as I'm concerned. And you need to really look at these studies and review the results. And once again, as I've repeatedly stated in this, the challenge is really proving a negative to determine whether this is a real finding or whether we need to take it with a grain of salt. So I thank everyone for your time. I'm going to save questions for the end.